Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today is our second Writer's Craft Talk episode. The first of the series was episode 109, where we asked a number of writers for their best writing advice, including the likes of Stephen Graham Jones, Paul Tremblay, Jessica McHugh, and many more. So if you haven't, then after listening to this, why not head back and check that one out too? This episode, we're concentrating on techniques for creating suspenseful scenes. This topic came about when we asked our patrons for what they wanted to hear on the This Is Horror podcast. After that, we took the five most popular ideas and put it to the public vote on Twitter. And thus, this episode was born. Before we get into the content, a quick word from our sponsors. Massive reptilian monsters have begun to emerge from Mexico's volcanoes, wreaking havoc on city after city. Now the nation's only hope is for physicist Elena Bass and anthropologist Alfonso Becerra to overcome their long-standing feud and work together. For only a blend of science and myth can save Mexico from the ancient lords of the earth. Available in ebook and paperback from Severed Press, Lords of the Earth is a harrowing Mexican kaiju novel from award winning writer David Bowles. You will never forget I Can Taste the Blood, a new collection of dark fiction from Bram Stoker nominees Josh Mallerman, John F.D. Taft, and more. Open the doors to a theater of the damned. Walk 500 miles in the footsteps of sin. Commit a crime spree that never ends. Witness life and death through the eyes of a tortured soul. And learn the truth about what's killing small town America. I Can Taste the Blood is now available at booksellers worldwide. Get more info at graymetalpress.com. Okay, and with that said, let's get straight into the episode. Techniques for creating suspense, starting with Stephen Volk. Hello, my name's Stephen Volk. Uh, I wrote Ghostwatch. Um, I was the lead writer on TV series called Afterlife. And my latest uh, collection of short stories is out now from PS Publishing called The Parts We Play. Um, suspense, yes. Well, I'd say one of the most important things in suspense, in writing suspense, is point of view. The point of view of the character going through the suspense. If you can catch that, you can really catch anything. Um, I'd say a wonderful example is in Psycho, when Marion Crane's sister arrives at the Psycho house. She's walking up towards the house, up the hill. I'm sure you can imagine the scene, uh, or remember the scene, rather. If you haven't seen the film, you need to see it urgently. Um, and what Hitchcock does is he cuts between the face of the woman walking up the hill to what she sees, then back to her face, reacting to what she sees. She gets closer, then back to her face, the house, the face, the house, the face, and it's all in the editing. Another wonderful thing that Hitchcock does, of course, is his sense of space. And I would urge you when you're writing to take a leaf from Hitchcock's book and don't fudge geography. Make sure the audience knows exactly what is where. So no shaky camera work and that kind of thing because the sense of space is your friend when you're creating suspense. The other thing is decide what you're going to withhold from the audience. William Friedkin, when I was working with him, would say very often the scariest thing in the world is a slow tracking shot to a closed door, which of course he used in The Exorcist. Um, so you need to decide what you're going to show when you're going to show it or what you're not going to show. True suspense, get back to Hitchcock, is the audience knowing more than the protagonist. So you're feeling really tense about what the outcome of the sequence is going to be. Hitchcock famously used the example of a bomb under the table. He said you can do it both ways. You can have it at the end of the sequence. You reveal it's a bomb when you have the explosion going off, and that will be a moment of shock and anxiety, which is over in, a, in an instant. On the other hand, he said, what's far better is if you show the bomb under the table as the guy starts his walk, which might be three minutes long, from the station towards the cafe where he's going to meet someone, if you're intercutting, showing the bomb under the table for the whole of that three, four, five minute sequence, that's five minutes of terror, as opposed to a moment that's over in an instant. 
The other thing I'd urge you to do is slow down when you're writing suspense. No fast cutting, no short sentences. Don't rush. This is not about excitement, it's about dread. It's not about the thrill of the chase, it's about a creeping sensation of anxiety. Watch The Birds, another Hitchcock classic, um, where the woman is waiting for a friend outside the school and the singing's go- singing of the children's going on in the school and she looks towards the climbing frame in the school playground and birds slowly gather. It's an absolute masterclass in building suspense. So I'd say these are the things to remember. Point of view, sense of space, what do you show, what do you not show. Remember the bomb under the table and slow down. Don't rush it. Okay, good luck. Bye. Hi, my name is Maura McHugh and I've written two collections published in the USA called Twisted Fairy Tales and Twisted Myths. I've written the comic book series Jennifer Wilde and Rogin Dove and co-written Witchfinder The Mysteries of Unland with Kim Newman for Dark Horse Comics. I've also written for theatre and for film and my short stories and essays have appeared in magazines and journals in the USA and Europe. Most recently I've had a story in The Madness of Dr Caligari edited by Joe Pulver. So, what are the best techniques for creating suspenseful scenes? This depends on which medium in which you are writing and your personal approach to writing. Some writers only work off a detailed treatment or step outline for each scene in their story, and other writers may use the instinctual approach and go where the characters or the scenario takes them. In the first draft, your focus is to complete the story, and after that, the finessing can occur. So perhaps the best advice I can offer is for when the scene is written and you are in the editing stage. At this point, you have your rough draft, but are looking to heighten or extend the anxious uncertainty in your reader. In all likelihood, you have instinctively done some of this work already, but now you can set about tweaking it for maximum efficiency. In any particular scene, you will have a goal, i.e. what do you want to achieve? It could be advancing the plot, revealing more about the character, or merely establishing an ambiance. Although at our best we hope to achieve several of these tasks in any one scene. It's best, however, to concentrate on perfecting at least one of these goals in the second draft, and layer in meaning and subtext on following drafts. Often, themes aren't clear in the first draft anyway. They are revealed as the story clarifies itself, and those elements can be carefully dispersed throughout the narrative in later drafts. Each scene is part of a larger series, so where it fits in the sequence will also affect how you tackle the goal of the scene. This is why if a story isn't working overall, it can be because there is a scene within the sequence which is out of sync with everything else. It may be too short, too long, or even misplaced. The story may need to start earlier or later. Scenes that are designed to specifically promote dread, fear, or worry in your reader require a threat. It may be active or implied, but you must have established a clearly in mind of the reader. Once again, pacing is crucial at this point. If you dangle the reader too long, they can become annoyed or bored, and too short, you have lost the potential for a greater final moment. Try to do something unanticipated by the reader. There are many ways to do this. For instance, heightening the risk by adding an extra threat, but one that is hidden from the protagonist of the story. Escalating the stakes in the scene is also another way to engage the reader. A strange pivot towards the end is a great way to disarm expectations and it can result in a rising tension which you can then either release or bring it into the next scene. Always be guided by your instincts. Breaking things down intellectually may not actually help you resolve your problem. In the end, if your aim is for horror, you must tap into what stresses you and what you cannot bear to contemplate. Then go right into the heart of that. Deeper is better. Even if others cannot quite penetrate your design, you must always write to suit yourself. Trust in the commonality of fear to unite your unique intentions with the reader's expectations. It may not always work, but you will at least have a better understanding of your abilities by the time you finally step away from the story.
Hello, this is Melissa Lason. I write alongside my twin sister, Michelle Garza. We are known as the Sisters of Slaughter. Check us out on Facebook and grab a copy of our novel, Mayan Blue, from Sinister Grin Press. Hey guys, this is Michelle Garza. We wanted to talk to you a little bit about suspense building. Melissa and I have always been enchanted by the art of storytelling. When we were little girls, one of our favorite things to do was sit around a campfire and listen to our father tell us ghost stories. Uh, we learned suspense building in those times when tales were passed from lips to the ear. Suspense was built slowly by giving away small hints that created pictures within the minds of the audience. Descriptions of every sight, smell, feeling, and sound. Like a storm that grows until the breezes become raging winds, trapping the characters and the listeners in situations they feel they cannot escape. When writing, we try to capture that feeling of being in the middle of nowhere in the dark, with the firelight casting shadows over the faces of people we knew and transforming them into things much darker. Our voice and our writing delivers the story, unfolding it in a way that doesn't give everything away at once, yet keeps the audience guessing and wondering until it's all revealed, and the horror of it creeps up their backs like a coat of spiders, tingling their spines and leaving them feeling unsafe and disgusted. Suspense is not about a jump scare at the end. It's about the growing terror and putting the pieces together until the truth is finally uncovered. Hi, this is John Skip, writer, filmmaker, bongo player, um, uh, editor of Fungasm Press, interpretive dancer, I, uh, and I've been asked to talk with you about how to generate suspense in a narrative. And um, I guess the main things I'd like to stress here are, number one, I like tight time frames. I really like a story that goes down in 24 hours, sometimes an hour and a half. Uh, I, I like uh, to be chronicling the moments as they happen. I feel that that adds considerable tension. Uh, a trick that can help you with that if you're doing it is the ticking clock, which appears uh, on your page, letting you know um, where you are in the timeline and when you're going to start running out of time, depending on the horrible consequence you've set up for the end of your book or the end of your scene. And uh, yeah, I mean, this can be commensurate with anything uh, from the the ticking bomb under the table that you don't know is there to the things you do know are there and are desperately racing to to resolve in time rescuing somebody you know the drill so a uh, big fan of tight time frames that don't give people lots of time to luxuriate in between uh, uh, you don't have to dedicate a chapter to their summer vacation when they get the phone call that maybe they left the water running or something uh, um, yeah, I like tight narratives in, in general, and just got to say that uh, the tighter, the better, as far as I'm concerned. The other thing, of course, and, and probably the main thing, is uh, characters that you actually give a fuck about, because if you're invested in them, if you care about them, uh, then uh, there's nothing more suspenseful than putting them in danger and going, oh no, I hope they're okay. Uh, there's nothing more powerful than putting somebody that you've gotten everybody to really love in terrible danger and then, uh, you know, killing them. Because you're like, oh, no, I, I like that guy. Um, and uh, a lot of times characters are just so kind of disposable or regular that it, it doesn't matter. Obviously, people who know how to write good characters have a, a big uh, jump on people who don't. And so... Uh, take characters that you genuinely care about, put them in tight time frames, and uh, watch them squirm, and your readers will too. This is Skip. I hope this has been useful as well as moderately entertaining, and I wish you a beautiful, non-suspense-packed day. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Jones Howe and I am the author of a short story collection called Vile Men. So I wouldn't normally consider my work to generically be suspenseful. When most people hear suspense, they think of heart-pounding action. 
but when you look at suspense as a whole, suspense is really just about the anxiety of what's going to happen next. So if you want to build a suspenseful scene, it's really just about building up hype around that anxiety. So suspense to me is mostly about suspense of emotion. I enjoy writing tense scenes between two people. I like writing about arguments or confrontations or restrained pillow talk, the sort of situations where emotions just threaten to come spilling out. So how I build that is first by knowing my characters and secondly by focusing on some of the finer details contained within that scene, be it through the characters or through the setting. So if you're writing about an argument, what kind of things about the other person are grading your character? It shouldn't be just the words that the other character is saying, but the tone and the manner, or maybe just the specific way that the antagonist of the scene turns his or her head or purses her lips. Like if you think about people who bug you, or if you're confronting people who bug you, there's just, there's always something that just grates at you about that other person. And I think those are the sort of things that it's really important to consider as a writer if you're trying to write a really suspenseful scene with another character in it. Um, if it's a confrontation, like what kind of moment makes your protagonist react or feel the need to confront somebody? Are they direct or are they holding back? And if they're holding back, what do they do? Do they gauge the room a little bit more first? Do they look at the person they're confronting? Have they really kind of built themselves up to doing so? Or are they going in pretending to be strong, but once they start their confrontation, does their voice start to shake? Do they get a little uncertain? Do they bite their lip a little more? Um, so to cite an example, I'll just try to use one of my short stories, The Inspiration. In it, a girl parked at a rest stop is approached by a man with a gun who forces her into the passenger seat so he can drive the car. Obviously, when you start out that story, that's the opening. You do see suspense in that moment and you want to keep reading on. So the reader's going to want to know that, but un the underlying emotional suspense kind of happens as the story continues. So as the man starts driving, the girl, she seems really ambivalent. She doesn't really talk much to the man, even though he's talking to her. Um, she listens to him, but instead of really feeling scared, she just kind of looks at her reflection in the mirror. She studies her face. She looks at her thighs and kind of pinches at her skin a bit. Um, and it eventually becomes obvious to the reader and to the man that the girl is suffering from an eating disorder and that her illness is so bad that she's distanced herself from the predic predicament she's in and can only see her own perception of her appearance. So eventually, the man pulls up to a McDonald's and buys the girl a cheeseburger. Now he thinks he's doing something good because he, he just sees this malnourished girl. But in the girl's frame of mind, this, this is when her predicament becomes real. This is a real moment to her. And so it's when he forces her to eat that cheeseburger that the culmination of who she is filters out and becomes the true suspense of the story and the reader figures out this is what happens so it's not it's not really about this crazy big ending to me suspense is about how a moment affects a character so if it affects a character in a different way then in by all means i would say that that's a better story it's a bit of a twist um but not a crazy exceptional one that you'd normally see in a movie um, so those are the sort of things that I enjoy writing about. Suspense through person-to-person -person interaction. If you think about it, suspense is literally everywhere. It's why people whip out their phones every time there's a confrontation on the bus or at a Walmart. It's why people love watching will-they-won't-they they sexual tension stories on TV. As frustrating as those can be and as cliche as they are, you still want to know to some degree. And it's why people like watching political panel discussions on the news. They just want to see people argue. They want one person to convince the other one that they're right. All of that, all of it is suspense. And all you have to do as a writer is find those kind of emotional situations that drive you, that make you feel something. And it's about putting yourself in the middle of the room between two characters who are feeling different things, who are reacting differently. And all you have to do is just start writing and all you have to do is turn up the heat. Hello, my name is Rich Hawkins. I'm a horror writer from the southwest of England. My books include The Last Plague Trilogy, Black Star, Black Sun, and King Carrion. In my experience, one of the best ways to create suspenseful scenes 
is to have a great deal resting upon the outcome of such a scene. What's at stake? A life? Several lives? Something else? Raise the stakes if you have to. I also find that a credible threat or villain is vital to creating suspense. Creating interesting characters contributes to suspense. If you feel connected to them, you'll be more likely to care about what happens to them. And from there comes the suspense. Now put them in a dangerous situation against a right motherfucker of an antagonist, and half the job is done. Now all you need to do is to write the scene competently. The reader has to believe that, that the protagonist is in danger, otherwise nothing will seem to be at risk. And it will seem like some cheesy 80s action film where the hero defeats his enemies with barely a shrug and a blaze of his AK-47. Give the reader something to be afraid for, and it should work. Another method is to have a character face their greatest fear. Make the consequences of failure so horrible that the character simply has to prevail. Other methods and good ways of creating suspense include credible motivations, unpredictable characters, strong opponents. All will contribute to suspenseful scenes. And that's it really. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. Hi, my name is Christy Demeester. I'm the author of Beneath, which is my debut novel forthcoming from Word Hort. Also the author of Split Tongues, which was a chapbook from Dim Shores that sold out earlier this year. So if you didn't get a copy, I'm really sorry, but maybe shoot me a message through my website and I might be able to get you a copy um, directly from me. Um, I'm also the author of a a handful, well, more than a handful now, of short stories from places such as Black Static, Shimmer, um, been in Euros Beds Weird Fiction, Volumes 1 and 3, um, among some other places. If you're interested in finding more of my work, you can visit my website, um, www.christydemeester.com. But I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about um, how to best build suspense or best suspense building techniques um, in writing. And I, w whenever I'm kind of trying to build a, a suspenseful scene in my own fiction, I always go back to the things that I really love the most in film, which is when the monster isn't shown, um, when the imagination really gets the chance to take over and create that horror for itself rather than being shown the face of the, of the horrifying thing so much to where it doesn't become suspenseful or frightening anymore. So my best technique for building a suspenseful scene is to let the suspense really happen in the quiet and happen in the place where you don't exactly see the terrifying thing or you, or you don't exactly see the thing that's supposed to make you afraid or supposed to make you feel that sense of suspense. And so I, I, I try to delay as, as long as I possibly can. Um, and so there's a lot of half reveal or a lot of partial reveal or a lot of introspection, especially for a protagonist in those moments when, you know, something's knocking at the door and, you're wondering what it is, or you, you don't want to open the door for fear of what's on the other side. Um, so for me, the most suspenseful moments are, are those moments when you don't really exactly know what's going on. There's maybe a sense of confusion or a sense of chaos or a sense of uh, sur something that's surreal because everything has taken on this dreamlike quality, which maybe isn't what most people think of when they think of suspense. But for me, that's, that's the most effective thing. You know, I, I go back to Shirley Jackson and those, those opening sequences where her stories just immediately throw you into this this dream state of you never really know if everything if anything that's going on is real or or not and and that creates this beautiful dreamlike quality where everything becomes suspenseful because you're never quite sure if everything is completely real or um even Charlotte Perkins Gilman's the uh, the yellow wallpaper that has such a beautiful moment of um of suspension right there toward the end where you're, you're tipping toward the knowledge that this is an unreliable narrator, but it's so subtly done that you, you put your entire trust in this woman the entire time until that final moment. And that, that final suspenseful moment when she's creeping around the room with her, her shoulder fitted in that groove and that yellow smooch along her dress. It's just so beautiful. Um, and so for me, suspense is much quieter then I think maybe a lot of people would define it, but um, it's it's what's always been 
most effective. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure if I answered the question as effectively maybe as someone wanted me to, but it's it's one of my favorite things of, of that disquieting sense of strangeness that creates suspense. Um, so hope hope that hope that kind of answered the question. Thanks again, guys. Have a good one. Hi, I'm J. Daniel Stone, author of The Absence of Light and Blood Kiss. For me, in order to create a suspenseful scene, I think the first challenge for the author is actual reader empathy for their characters. Part of suspense is the build-up before we reach the fulcrum. What an author needs to successfully do, and this is very difficult, no matter what anyone says, no matter how successful no matter how many successful thriller books there are out there that practice this daily, the impetus behind a suspenseful scene is to have your reader or your audience care about your characters or fall in love with them. Or colloquially, we can say, make the reader give a shit about the people you're writing about. And once you have your readers by the throats or standing on the tip of their toes, in love, head over heels with your characters... Uh, I think the best thing or the simplest or most common thing to do is to actually seriously rip the floor out from beneath your character's feet. And once you do that, now your characters are in this maddened limbo of what do I do next? How do I get back my life the way it was before, before everything turned to shit? And if you have, as an author, successfully gotten your audience engaged and gotten them to truly care about your characters, they will feel many emotions and this in turn is what suspense really is. We bite our nails, we laugh, we cry, we act irrationally and that's what authors want their readers to be doing when they read their books. That's our job as writers. We need to read the reality around us and put that reality into books, a fictionalized reality. Because honestly, there is nothing more frightening and scary than the real world. And if we can successfully marry the real world into fictional stories, if we can successfully have our characters loved by readers like we love our families and our friends and our husbands and our wives, and if we rip everything away from them and then we give our characters a new mission to try and take back what they once had, you will keep your reader in a large amount of suspense. Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie Wytovich and I'm the author of the Bram Stoker Award-nominated poetry collections Hysteria, Morning Jewelry, an Exorcism of Angels, and Brothel. And my debut novel, The Eighth, is coming out later this month from Dark Regions Press. When it comes to writing terrifying scenes, the best technique that I've learned to incorporate into my writing is to write about what scares me the most, but to do so in a way where I slow down the prose or the stanza and show my readers all the ins and outs of the characters, their setting, and the backdrops to their fears, like how fast they're breathing, the pattern the blood is making as it drips down their throat, the sound of the slaps of bodies on bodies. I work in extremes, show the dichotomy of pain and pleasure, sex and death, and I think terrifying scenes are best created in the same fashion that's comparable to how lovers work in the bedroom. It's either slow and sensual, building to the climax as the two work together until it all becomes too much, or it's fast and messy, Full of bites and bruises with the final scene coming too fast too unexpected that in the end both parties are surprised as they lie there breathless their hearts pounding their bodies shaking terrifying scenes to me are all about the seesaw the crescendo of screams the pitfalls of sighs I want the graphic, the slashes and the cuts, and then I want the encroaching silence that's stuffed deep inside the lungs of a corpse these scenes question what we know our morals, our faith, how we think we would react in a given situation. And when we make the reader uncomfortable, when we force them to question their actions, their turn-ons, when we put the knife in their hand or their finger on the trigger, we force them to play what if, 
make them participate in the scene. And then we have them right where we want them, panicked, on edge. The very idea of murder, of torture, of failure, of feeling so intense, so unsettling, that it takes a fraction of a second to push them over, to send them into reoccurring nightmares that tug at their skin and mutate in their heads. We, as writers, perform the striptease of horror, show them a little, then take it back, show them a little more flesh, a little skin, then crawl back into the shadows where we belong. We seduce, we make them lustful, we create a titillating atmosphere that makes them want to take a chance, no matter how bad the consequences might be. And just when they think they're safe, just when they're ready to let down all their walls, that's when we step out of the darkness. That's when we show our face, take off our mask. Terrifying scenes are all about what's waiting around the corner. What you thought you got rid of, but just didn't bury quite deep enough. My name is... T.E. Grau, and I'm the author of The Nameless Dark. I'm the author of The Mission, The Lost Act, Close Stories, and my upcoming novella from This Is Horror titled They Don't Come Home Anymore. Um, the question is how to create a suspenseful uh, scene, how to create a successfully suspenseful theme. And I would think, and well, I guess I would know because I'm giving you an answer, that the best way to do it would be to be patient with that scene. Um, it's, it's all about creating atmosphere first. It's about creating setting, misdirection, and setting something up, um, the backdrop that you can sort of get lost in. And if, if you can do that in a successful way, in, in, in a strong way, then, and then introducing elements of, you know, of, the, of the overall plot slowly, patiently, I think that that can be a good way to sort of draw that out, draw out that dread suspense. Um, so that's how I, I would do it. I guess that's how I, I, I do do it. I, I hope I do it well. But that's my advice. Hi, this is Lisa Minetti and Michael David Wilson from This Is Horror asked me to talk a little bit today about creating suspense in the scenes that you write for fiction. Uh, he also asked me to mention a few of my recent titles. So I have a short story called The Hermit, which is out in Never Fear the Tarot, and another called Arbeit macht frei, which is out in Gutted Beautiful Horror Stories. That's from Crystal Lake Publishing. Um, also, Death Watch is a collection of mine, which contains one of my novellas, which is called Dissolution, which will soon be a feature-length film developed and directed by Paul Layden. Um, the Gentling Box, which won the Bram Stoker Award. And uh, last year, The Box Jumper, which was a finalist for the Stoker Awards and for the Shirley Jackson Awards, and actually also won Novella of the Year from This Is Horror. So. Michael asked me to talk a little bit about creating suspense, and I thought that I would talk about the concept of the deadline or the ticking clock or whatever motif you're comfortable with calling it. Um, and I thought I would use two films to illustrate this concept because one has a very definite, you know, time is of the essence, and the other one has an implied. And I think they're films we're probably all very familiar with. So the first is Titanic. And what's the ticking clock? Very obviously, we know from history, even before we see the film, we know that the Titanic is going to sink. But what's interesting about the whole idea of the deadline that you're creating for your characters, through this, in this case the situation, is how your characters are going to react under that pressure. So we see, for example, you know Jack and Rose finding different ways, once they know that that ship is sinking, how they're going to overcome every obstacle that's between them and freedom, which is the way through the character work is showing us that we are rooting for them and that we hope somehow they manage to escape. We know, of course, they don't. But the thing to keep in mind is that you, by knowing that, you, you're, that there's a deadline that must be fulfilled, you're automatically generating suspense. The second film I wanted to talk a little bit about is another one I think we're all very familiar with, and that's Castaway. Now, in this case, it's the exact opposite, because even though at the very beginning of the Tom Hanks character is 
obsessed with time and making sure that things are delivered on time. I mean, that's really his obsession. Interesting, the way that the writer uh, chose to develop that was once the plane crashes and he goes down and he's on that island, he has nothing but time. However, what makes it, I think, a really good way to illustrate, in this case, it's an implied deadline. In other words, the when you're viewing the film, and you want to keep this in mind when you're writing your fiction, you're automatically generating when will be he be rescued? How will he be rescued? So it's an implied deadline. How long is he going to be on the island? What's happening with Kelly? We only see the entire time that he's on the island, we only see his thoughts about her. We don't know what is going to be her reaction. We don't know that he's going to be rescued. And it's used very cleverly. And you can also use not just an actual ticking clock like in Titanic, but you can also use an implied deadline to generate suspense and interest and conflict for your characters. Again, how will they solve the situation? How will they overcome the obstacles that you as the writer place in their way? Um, even after he's rescued, we don't know what's going to happen with Kelly. So, again, keep it in mind, deadlines, we all hate them, we all fear them, but they also motivate us. And um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the whole crew at This Is Horror and Michael David Wilson for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about this. And uh, you can certainly find me or send me an email um, or find me on Facebook, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about this. Um, and my website is www.lisaminetti.com. Thanks very much, and good luck with your fiction. Hi, this is Paul Michael Anderson, writer of the book Bones Are Made to Be Broken. So, you want to write a successful, suspenseful scene. I know I'm not the only writer being asked this, but for me, suspense is um, the knowledge, is waiting for the other shoe to drop. The knowledge that the worst is yet to come. That's suspense. Bare bones. And from there, there are two types of suspenseful scenes. There's essentially the narrative equivalent of a knock-knock joke, and then there's the long game like uh, situation, suspenseful situation. The knock-knock joke version. I'm a kid of the 80s. I grew up on like Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Sleepaway Camp, you know, family-friendly fare. And those movies are littered with scenes um, with knock-knock joke suspense. Essentially, these characters who really only exist as walking blood bags are, say, you know, traversing the woods ab around the abandoned summer camp. And you know the killer's going to jump out at some point. You hear the branches breaking, the leaves rustling, the rocks tumbling. But you don't know when the killer's going to jump out. And then the killer ju does. And that's the punchline. You know, the blood bags get opened up. Narrative moves forward. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, that's the knock-knock joke suspense. Long game suspense is a little different. It's where the suspense slowly builds up over the course of the narrative. Kind of like the plot map, but not quite. The best example I have is of Joe Hill's novel Horns. Ig Parrish gets these gets his power to make everyone tell the truth, and he decides he's going to figure out who killed his girlfriend because everyone thinks it's him. And he eventually figures out who the killer is, but that's not the end of the story. He is easily overwhelmed by the killer, and the reader spends the entire narrative waiting for Ig, the main character, to kind of be able to overcome uh, the killer himself and take and bring justice, bring the killer to justice of whatever form that is. And what I'm talking about here, why this is my preferred one and why knock knock joke suspense, the visceral suspense doesn't really work, has to do with empathy um, for the character. The ability for the audience to relate to the characters in the situation. That the situation that is going on right now, no matter how fantastic, how impossible, has characters that, for the parameters of the story, you believe are real. And that's incredibly hard to do. It has almost nothing to do with the scene that you're writing. Because empathy builds slowly. Um, relatability, hum humanity of the characters builds slowly. It happens over a period of 100 pages or 200 pages, or in short fiction, you have a handful of scenes to do this. And that's hard to do. A lot of successful writers can't do it. <laughs> I My running joke is I can do it maybe after four drafts. You know, empathy comes from the audience n 
relating some aspect of the character's personality or knowing someone with a, that aspect of personality. Maybe that character's been in situations that the audience, him or herself, can identify with. Or like, I've been there before. Um, prior scene situations, not the one with the suspense, maybe. Um, that's the Those are the rudiments of building empathy, of fleshing out the character. But to me, that's key. You need that empathy for the audience to really care about the suspense um, for it to have a lasting effect. The knock-knock joke suspense of 80 slasher flicks doesn't last, as, other than maybe it was a cool effect from Tom Savini or Greg Nicotero. Um, the good suspense, the one where you care about those characters, um, that comes from empathy. And if I'm successful at all, it's because I've managed to do that. I, I don't know how much you can talk about your own work here, um, but the, the scene that jumps out for me beyond someone else's fiction and my own fiction is our characters where the suspense is almost internal where it the suspense is making the right or wrong decision there's a scene in one of my stories in the book um called crawling back to you it's about a vampire and it's familiar you know real lighthearted stuff but i built it around the idea of toxic relationships and the 1980s go figure and for me, if the, the chase at the end and the build-up to the climax has to do with the, our protagonist's decision of whether or not to get out of this toxic relationship and if she can get out. And if the suspense works, it's because of that, because of that empathy. Because maybe they, the audience has seen a toxic relationship like that before or has maybe been in one themselves. Empathy, that's kind of the big technique for me. You know, there are other things, but I only have five minutes, so, you know... Your quarter's up. Good morning. It's um, Saturday morning. Uh, it's quite early, and my name is Simon Kirk Unsworth, and I am the author of two novels, The Devil's Detective and The Devil's Evidence, both of which are out from Delray in the UK and Doubleday in the US, and four collections of short stories, um, Lost Places from Ashtree Press, Quiet Houses, um, which is currently unavailable, uh, a Lost Place is coming out um, later this year as a reprint from Exaggerated Press, incidentally. Um, Strange Gateways from PS Publishing and the brand new Diseases of the Teeth from Black Shook Books. Uh, this is Horror have asked me to ask the, answer the question, what are the best techniques for creating suspense? Um, and I've been thinking about it for all of uh, maybe 30 seconds now because I uh, um, it's early, like I say, and I've only just woken up. Um, and I think the most important thing in terms of creating suspense is to put your characters and your plot in a place where there is danger. Suspense works because there is a threat or a risk, either to an individual or to a set of individuals that are within your narrative or to the sort of narrative itself. So if the thing happens that's bad, your, your plot goes in a different direction, you know, the bad thing happens. That, however, only works if you are, for example, putting your characters at risk, the reader has to care about those characters. So your characters themselves have to be invested with a certain amount of reality and connection points people have to be able to see themselves in those characters and see themselves in those characters actions even if they don't like them they have to be able to connect with them so that when the risk comes they don't want what is going to happen or what is being implied and threatened might happen to actually happen to them i think that's particularly important when you're writing horror or sort of dark thrillers particularly because for, for me, horror fiction is at its best where it shows you life's fragility. And as an author, I try and do that by putting my characters in situations in which that fragility, the fragility of their lives is shown to them and through them shown to the reader. You have to make your reader wonder if I was in that situation and that bad thing happened to me, how would it make me feel? And it's not just about physical harm although that's sometimes a part of it for me it's always about the bigger picture suspense works because of the threat not just to someone's person but to their wider life if this thing happens their life will be dismantled or destroyed or irrevocably changed in a way that they don't want or don't expect practically um quite often 
suspense scenes have shorter sentences um, which move the, um, the sort of the action on fast um, they can often have shorter paragraphs which prevent presents again a kind of a faster moving text a faster moving narrative um, description should be less I would say in suspense scenes um, because you need to focus on the suspense itself rather than the colour of the wallpaper or the lovely pattern on the Persian carpet below the character's feet um, unless the pattern of the Persian carpet is how you're creating suspense, maybe the patterns of the carpet's moving, I don't know. Um, so I think there are practical things that you can do, but the most important thing is to set your characters up so that the reader cares about them and cares about what may happen to them. And there's also a sense of mystery to it. The suspense is whether the thing will happen, and maybe part of that is to a, a, a real sense of not being sure. Um, if your plot is very predictable, if you're not thinking through, you know, the, the whys and wherefores of, of how to keep the reader on their toes, they'll assume that the bad thing can't happen because this is a, a narrative they've read a hundred times before or a thousand times before. So it's always worth doing un, unexpected things earlier in your narrative so that the reader doesn't trust you. Um, George R. R. Martin is a, a, a classic of that, you know, killing characters off that you don't expect to die means that then all of his characters are always under threat because you're never sure that he'll follow what we might call standard narrative tropes and keep the certain people alive. Um, actually, they're all at risk and they may all die horrible bloody deaths. So there you have it. Um, put your characters under threat, um, put their lives at risk uh, and be unexpected. I hope that helps and good luck with it. Hi, my name is Philip Farkasi. I'm an author and a screenwriter. Um, my books include the novelettes uh, Mother and Alder from Dunham's Manor Press. Uh, my current novella from Journal Stone is called Fragile Dreams, and I have a collection coming in March 2017 called Behold the Void, also from Journal Stone. Um, well, I want to thank This Is Horror for having me here to talk about... Uh, some techniques to create suspense in, in the, your scenes. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, what I do in Fragile Dreams. This Fragile Dreams is about a guy who's buried beneath a, a building uh, of rubble after an earthquake, and he's in the dark, and he's in a lot of pain, um, and he's scared, uh, and, he's, and, uh, and he's hurt. And, and what I do in that story to create suspense is I, I limit what the reader knows to what the protagonist knows. As a narrator, I don't give away anything um, outside of the protagonist perspective. So, um, you know, he, you only know uh, that it's dark. You only know that you're in a lot of pain, uh, that there are things scurrying around uh, in the rubble around you, and you don't know what they are. And, and um, as a reader, this puts you in the mind uh, of the protagonist, to put you in the place that he's in. You also are in the dark. You are also feeling uh, the pain of the weight crushing down on you. Uh, you're afraid and of what might be out there uh, scurrying around uh, while you're trapped, um, helpless. So uh, that's one technique. I call it restricted POV. Um, another technique is uh, what I call a wild card. A wild card is... Um, Creating uh, something in a scene that doesn't necessarily propel the story forward or or, or enhance um, the scene other than to create uh, a little suspense and a little tension. Uh, examples of this could be um, a, a very loudly ticking clock that suddenly stops ticking, uh, a goldfish in a bowl that is splashing an inordinate amount of water while two people are talking. Um, somebody screaming uh, in the next room about something angrily uh, that you know they don't can't quite hear or make out. Um, these are all things that can be added to a scene to create more tension uh, and what might otherwise be a rather mundane dialogue scene or back and forth but it gives the reader a little sense of something's not right here things are not as well as they could be. Um, something bad is on the horizon. Uh, a technique that I use in a story called Mandala, which is uh, the last story in my collection, is I, I get really creative with scene breaks. And this is something I also do in my screenwriting, but um, you can do it just as well in, in your prose. So creative scene breaks are 
uh, a way to extend the tension or extend the suspense of a moment. Um, if a man is running uh, along a road and he's thinking about his ex-wife and he's daydreaming and he's not paying attention um, and uh, 10 yards up ahead is a hole in the, in the pavement, uh, rather than just take the scene right to uh, its, um, its final uh, moment, uh, I cut away. Uh, just as he's, you know, getting closer, and I go to the ex-wife who's in a grocery store putting milk and juice and bread in a grocery cart, and maybe the milk is expired, just for fun, just to give you a sense of everything's a little uh, not as sunny and cheery as it could be. Uh, everything's a little bit off. Um, and then just as she is approaching uh, to pay and realizes uh, that she recognizes the cashier as somebody she once uh, knew, you cut back to this guy who's running and um, and culminate in whatever happens to him in that hole on the ground. So scene breaks is another way of, of extending the tension, uh, creating more suspense, uh, little cliffhangers uh, throughout the story. Um, again, uh, you have to be careful with it. You, you don't want to go crazy, but it is a fun way to kind of break things up and, and keep people guessing at what's going to happen next. Um, in the story I wrote called Alter, uh, I do a couple things. Um, the first thing I do is uh, I build tension by using uh, language, certain kinds of adjectives um, when describing things that are otherwise every day. For example, Alter is about a family that goes to a, a community pool on a bright summer day. Uh, so on its surface, there's nothing really that scary about that. So what I had to do is I had to kind of create scary ways to describe things without going over the top. So in other words, um, there's a scene where as they're driving to the pool, the kid's looking out the back of their station wagon at a car that's following them, and the, the sun is glinting off the chrome grill of the car, and it looks to the, looks at the boy's imagination as a metal mouth waiting to bite down into the rear of their station wagon uh, every time it approaches at a red light. So that's one example. Uh, the, 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 the shimmering pool can you know, look like a broken glass. The... The, the slate uh, gray sky can be look hard as, uh, you know, a concrete ceiling. These are all things that just give you a sense as a reader that this isn't a happy story. Things are not going to go well. Something bad's going to happen. And while necessary, not necessarily anything bad's happening with the action, I'm giving you enough hints, although albeit subtly, that you know that something is, is not right. Uh, another thing I do in that story is I seed. Uh, an ultimate horror. What I mean by seeding an ultimate horror, and this is done a lot in novels and screenplays, is you hint. Um, you know, in Alter, there's a crack at the bottom of the pool that's noticed by one of the swimmers uh, in the first few pages. Um, this turns out to be a problem uh, <laughs> near the end of the story. Uh, it can be a bald tire on a car. It can be a frayed rope um, that's holding up a light fixture over a character's head. Um, it can be a phone that doesn't work properly. Um, so that when ultimately uh, something worse happens to that crack in the pool or that car drives off the road on a slippery uh, wet night or um, when the phone doesn't work, when the killer is you know, breaking down the door, when the rope snaps and the chandelier drops. Um, these are all things that, that, that you can build toward, that you can seed early on so that when they do ultimately happen, um, you've created a suspense, uh, suspense leading up to it. So again, uh, these are my, you know, a few tips and tricks that I use. Uh, again, it's the inner voice of the restricted POV. Um, add a wild card to your more mundane scene, something that uh, gives the uh, reader a suggestion that something's um, uh, not right, uh, that something could go poorly. Uh, use creative scene breaks to go in and out of scenes rather than necessarily uh, culminating them uh, all the way to the end. Build tension by uh, colorful language uh, and uh, adjectives when describing mundane and everyday things. And, you know, drop seeds, uh, hint at the terror that's to come uh, so that people want to keep turning those pages. Uh, I hope this helps you with your writing. It's helped me uh, with mine. And I want to thank This Is Horror for having me. Again, this is Philip Fercasi, and thanks very much. I'm Michael Weehunt, author of the story collection Greener Pastures, which is available from Shock Totem Publications. I have to admit something right off the bat. I don't think much about suspense when I'm writing a story. 
Why is that? Well, I have three to five minutes to explain myself, or else I don't really belong on this episode, do I? I think it comes down to what type of writer you are. I tend to play everything by ear to a large degree. If you're like me in that regard, a lot of the suspense takes care of itself because you yourself don't know what's going to happen. The joy and the terror is in the discovery. You're laying your own signposts that say no trespassing or danger or beware of the thing that ate our dog. For me at least, the suspense is something I feel internally, and I trust it to come through in the writing. I'm trying to unnerve myself with my own words as I go. If I can do that, a lot of the work is already done. I'm sorry, I just saw something peeking in my window. It's dark out. It was probably nothing. But what if you write by the seat of your pants and intend to go back later, now that you know what the signposts were warning you about, and build suspense into your story for the reader? This is where I have to admit the same thing again, but in a different way. I don't think much about suspense when I'm writing a story because what I pay attention to is dread. I strive for dread, and when I think I achieve it, I really pride myself on it. I love that tension, that building creepiness that slowly gathers around the reader and or characters. Dread is crucial in a horror story, and for me at least, it overshadows regular plot-based suspense. I'm looking for dread, wanting to feel it as well as convey it as I initially write something because it's generally more important to me than plot. I rewrite as I write, so that's what works for me. Even though I'm not a big planner, I do have thoughts on this for writers who meticulously plan every detail out before they write, or those who halfway sketch a scene and try to work a little of that discovery into the process. But this goes for whatever kind of writer you are. Use the same tricks as everybody else. They're tricks for a reason, because they have worked many times in the past. But what I recommend is that you make them your own. Worried that having a creepy sound in the closet, the protagonist waking up to wonder what it was, has been done a thousand times before? Do it anyway, but in a way that only you can. And this is where imagery comes into the picture. It's very important. Stretch it out a little so that the reader is squirming in their seat at your descriptions. The weird sound, the protagonist sliding out of bed to silently place their feet on the cold floor, standing up, creeping across the room, the one floorboard they knew to avoid because it creaks, but oops, there it goes creaking, but it blends in with the creak of the closet door opening in the same moment. The protagonist freezes with terror and the blackness of the closet widens, a dark that's darker than the bedroom's dark, and the reader is caught in a moment of waiting. What will move next? The protagonist or the unknown element emerging from the closet? I'd recommend not having a cat jump out of the closet. That's a trick that really has been done to death. But most things are fair game. In one of my recent stories, something is under the bed, and the protagonist realizes it and lies there dreading what it might be. I was deliberately playing with something that's old school, but I wanted to draw the scene out in my own descriptive way to really make my skin crawl. Hopefully I pulled it off. But even if you're using something that's entirely new, say a haunted toaster oven, you can still use time-tested ways of creating dread. You're just limiting yourself to the construct of a toaster oven, and I wish you luck with that. Another factor is the type of story you're writing, particularly the point of view. If you have a more omniscient narrator, you can easily let the reader know more than the protagonist knows. The protagonist is about to nonchalantly go into a room that the reader knows has a spooky monster in it. That's a proven way to build suspense. Personally, I rarely write in that mode, so my mileage varies. If it's first person or a single limited third person, where the POV follows the one protagonist's viewpoint and thoughts closely, it's trickier to do that. The reader typically knows what the protagonist knows and little more. If you can find clever ways to circumvent that, more power to you. Point out the closet a couple of times earlier in the story, but in ways that feel organic with the lightest touch of unease. Then later on, when the protagonist wakes up to a weird scratching from the closet, it will resonate a bit more. Seriously, what was that at my window just now? Some sort of tapping noise. It sure is dark outside. Anyway, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Not really. Not many can. I could also bring up foreshadowing, especially in longer works. You plant seeds about things that are to come, whether three or 100 pages later. When those things arrive, the reader will feel a tingle of tension. They were warned about this moment, after all. In my current project, I mention a certain place on page 15 or so. I mention it in passing, how it must have been lovely once, but has become something much darker now. 
but I don't intend to actually show that place in the story until maybe page 150. I have no idea what I'll actually write when I get there. I might have scrapped that small part of the story by that point. Like I said, I'm not very good at thinking ahead. But if not, I'll have some built-in suspense when I get there. Speaking of which, I thought I saw something in my window again just now. It was probably just the wind blowing a tree branch. I'll move on and put it out of my mind. Overall, I recommend thinking cinematically. I don't really mean using the movies to create suspense. Sometimes movies often fail at that, in my opinion. But think in a cinematic way. Visualize every detail. Use all your senses as though you yourself were filming it, or you yourself were experiencing it and being filmed, and it will come across the way you want it to. Just make sure your character is reacting to the surroundings in a way that feels true, and you can bring whatever you want creeping up behind. Thanks for listening. May you find great success in your... Wait, the, the window's opening. A huge thank you to the 16 writers that contributed their wonderful advice to the episode. On a serious note, if anyone has heard from Michael Weehunt, if you could please get in contact with me, michael at thisishorror.co.uk. I thought that the audio clip was a joke at first. He was just having fun, but... I haven't heard from him, so I'm really not sure what's going on and if he's okay. <laughs> he's not responded to emails, not responded to my messages on Facebook, and no red receipt either, so... I hope it's just a coincidence, but look, it's better to, to just know for sure, so please, if you hear from Michael Weehunt, do get in contact with me. Seems kind of wrong, but I, I guess we should hear from the sponsors anyway. Massive reptilian monsters have begun to emerge from Mexico's volcanoes, wreaking havoc on city after city. Now the nation's only hope is for physicist Elena Bass and anthropologist Alfonso Becerra to overcome their long-standing feud and work together. For only a blend of science and myth can save Mexico from the ancient lords of the earth. Available in ebook and paperback from Severed Press, Lords of the Earth is a harrowing Mexican kaiju novel from award winning writer David Bowles. You will never forget I Can Taste the Blood, a new collection of dark fiction from Bram Stoker nominees Josh Mallerman, John F.D. Taff, and more. Open the doors to a theater of the damned. Walk 500 miles in the footsteps of sin. Commit a crime spree that never ends. Witness life and death through the eyes of a tortured soul. And learn the truth about what's killing small town America. I Can Taste the Blood is now available at booksellers worldwide. Get more info at graymetalpress.com. Okay, we're back. I've still not heard from Michael. I was hoping during that little interlude that something would come in. On a lighter note, when I was speaking with Simon Kurt Unsworth, our wires were crossed a little, and he ended up submitting his best writing advice as well as advice for creating suspense so with that said here is a little bonus clip the best writing advice that Simon Kurt Unsworth has ever received hello my name is Simon Kurt Unsworth and I'm the author of two novels The Devil's Detective and The Devil's Evidence both of which are out from Delray in the UK and Doubleday in the US and which are available in most good bookstores. I also have four collections of short stories available, uh, Lost Places, which came out initially from Ashtree Press and which is being re-released by Exaggerated Press um, later this year or next year. Quiet Houses, which is currently unavailable um, for now. Um, Strange Gateways from Pierce Publishing and the brand new Diseases of the Teeth, which is out from Black Shook Books um, and is available right now. 
I'm sat in a very cold room in the Lake District in the north of England trying to think about writing advice. And actually I'm going to cheat ever so slightly. I'm going to give you the best piece of advice I was never given, but which I think is important, and then the best piece of advice that I was actually given. The best piece of advice I have never been given uh, in relation to writing is to value your rejections. It's really important that when your work is rejected, when it is critically addressed, when it is not just told it's rubbish, but when someone actually takes the time to tell you why they don't like it or to tell you why it doesn't fit what the criteria of their sort of, you know, submissions guidelines are, that you actually listen. Don't chuck your rattle out of the pram. Rejections are the writer's universe's way of telling them that they are still needing to improve. And the second you don't think you need to improve is the second you may as well stop writing. For me, writing is a constant learning process. It's like anything. The more you do, the better you get. And the better you get, the more you enjoy it. And the more you enjoy it, hopefully, the more you do. And the more you do, the better you get. So even now when I submit short stories and they are rejected it's important for me to understand why sometimes it's just didn't like it that's okay sometimes it's that I hadn't written correctly to the guidelines and I need to understand that stuff so I would say very strongly to value your rejections listen to criticism particularly from people you trust I got an email the other day from my agent um, thoroughly criticising some work that I had submitted to him um, for uh, the next thing that we were looking to do. And the initial reaction was quite a sulky one of, you know, why didn't you like it? But then when you actually sit and read it, you realise that he said lots of very sensible things and you think, actually, I can make my piece of work much better um, if I just listen to these. It's also important to remember that just because someone criticises it and just because you read and maybe even understand why they've made that criticism doesn't mean to say you have to actually do what they're suggesting or change it how they say. Part of the point of being a writer is to understand the, 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 the line past which you aren't prepared to go, past which you aren't prepared to change your work because it feels like it simply isn't yours anymore. Um, and actually the point where I thought that of myself as a proper writer was the point at which I started to occasionally say to editors, no, I don't want to change that particular line, that particular idea, because that doesn't feel right. So value your rejections. The best piece of advice I have ever actually been given is this. I asked the question once of a group of writer friends of mine, and I, I sort of said, well, when do you know you're ready to actually start writing the novel? When do you stop doing the research and the plotting and the structuring and thinking through the characters and the scenes that you have in your head and how they all fit together because actually you can just go around in circles forever and a friend of mine gave me this advice and it's advice I would urge you all to take to heart and to do and he said this he said stretch your arms out and wiggle the fingers and stretch them so that they're nice and loose and limber and then start fucking typing or writing if you write by pencil and pen in paper because unless you do that you'll never write anything and it sounds really obvious, but it's absolutely true. You can get bogged down in the thinking about writing to the point where you don't do the actual writing. At some point, and make it sooner rather than later, you have to commit to the writing itself. What you produce might be shit. Good. Shit is better than nothing because shit can be improved or shit can be thrown away and rewritten. Nothing is just nothing. So that's it. Value your rejections and actually do some writing. Um, I'm not sure whether that's any use to anybody, um, but they are the things that keep me um, focused on writing when I write, so maybe you'll find them useful. All right, so out of respect for Michael Weehunt, I'm not going to end with any writing advice. It seems, yeah, it just seems a little bit wrong, but I will catch you next week. We've got Ray Cluley on the show. If you'd like to support the podcast, as always, do so over at Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And until next time, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror, and as always, have a great, great day. Mm -hmm.